also am a big believer, both as a rhetorician as, and as a feminist, in the idea of embodied scholarship. Like, I don't think it's ethical to try to take myself out of the scholarship as someone who is a witness who is testifying, right? Who's someone who's, who's a, a participant as well as an observer, and someone who has a stake in you know, the future of e-learning, or as a citizen in the future of e-government. And I also like to try to make things clear. Um, so uh, I'll pass around my first book, and you'll see that it has 50 pages of footnotes, and it's, it's, it's got some pretty dense theoretical material. But I do feel like it's helpful to make complex arguments about technology, particularly those that have a policy aspect, clear. And in fact, I've gone so far on this front that I actually am, have co-authored a comic book and have worked with designers and uh, artists to try to write about rhetoric for average people from the clearest possible point of view. And this was actually the most difficult writing project I've ever done. It took five years. Um, and I think in introducing my work, it's also important to give a shout out to uh, Julia Lepton, who was my uh, collaborator and partner in crime for a number of years when I was at UC Irvine. She's currently on a Guggenheim Fellowship this year. Um, I don't know if you've had an opportunity to meet Julia. She used to head the UCI Design Alliance, and I think that they're um, interesting uh, exchanges that could happen between the two campuses. Um, but she's a big believer in uh, humanities design. Thinking about possible, you know, often humanities scholars are more resistant to explore um, conversations, scholarly conversations, and kind of interdisciplinary conversations around design. And she's been a, an advocate for trying to kind of break down those barriers. So my first book is, has a very short title, but a very long subtitle. And the subtitle is An Electronic History of Government Media Making in a Time of War, Scandal, Disaster, Miscommunication, and Mistakes. And it's a book that I start off with a story. And I describe. Um, it was, let's see, it would have been 1989. Um, I was running an after-school delinquency prevention center with a computer lab um, and teaching kids to program in BASIC and Pascal and doing the kinds of things that people did in computer labs at the time. And I also, you know, helped, helped people with their homework and taught them to type and that sort of thing. And there was this new system called PEN, Public Electronic Network. It was a very early e-government system. Um, and it's been written about quite a lot. So if you read any work by Howard Rheingold about um, sort of smart mobs using digital technologies, PEN is often a case study that people point to. So I had all of these kids who had been referred to this after-school cent center, uh, some of whom were gang members, some of whom were homeless. and I thought it would be awesome to put them on PEN. Because the idea of PEN was supposed to be that uh, average citizens would be able to form committees with other citizens, figure out what issues were important, and then communicate directly with their elected representatives. So the idea was instead of having to kind of wait at a city hall meeting, which was often very inconvenient and difficult for people to do, this would allow a, a, a more convenient way for them to have that kind of interaction. And I thought, this would be awesome. I thought I would take my disenfranchised teenagers who I felt had been treated unfairly by systems of power that just kept them down, and this would give them the opportunity to sort of say, you know, hey, it would be great to have a new basketball court in our neighborhood, or, you know, the police are really unfair in their treatment of young people on this particular corner. And so I was like a real cheerleader for this pen system. And I was like, this is going to be so fun to write letters to your elected officials. And you know, you can imagine what my clients thought of that activity as something to do after school. And also, the other thing is, at the time, all the usernames and passwords were really long. And so you'd have to like write down all these incredibly long usernames, and then the students would lose them. So I felt like I was a kind of Pollyanna pushing the system, you know, oh, pen, it'll be so great. And the students were just not buying it. You know, they just, they were super, super resistant. And then suddenly things changed. Suddenly they were all on pen and they were typing away and they seemed very engaged with it. And I was elated. 
I thought, wow, cyber democracy has come and my students are participants and this is going to be so wonderful. And then I figured out that they were talking to each other. And sometimes they were talking to each other in the same room so that it wasn't, there wasn't any sort of time lag, that they were actually essentially doing a very high-tech version of passing notes in my computer lab. And I was crestfallen. And of course, the funny thing is they were using the technology, they were appropriating that technology in exactly the same way that people use social media today. And what I failed to understand is that was a kind of politics too, and that it was, it's important to sometimes recognize the politics that is meaningful to a given population of users rather than try to foist on them your own understanding of what political communication means. So that sort of shapes my attitude in this book. And I'll pass around copies because there are lots of pictures in it, which you know, I had to like fight to get the rights for, including in one case from the, um, the family of a deceased surface man and an another from the family of a, a minor child. So you know, getting rights to images is always tricky to do. Um, so uh, during the Bush administration, there was a common perception that George Bush was out of touch when it came to the digital practices of, the citizen, of citizenry and kind of what was changing about how people were using technologies, particularly technologies of social media. And there was this tendency to sort of think about the Bush administration as this kind of evil entity that was trying to constrain digital rights. Now, of course, the irony is that a lot of that constraint on digital rights is an inheritance of the Clinton administration, if you kind of look back at legislation and policy. And then in some ways, the Obama administration, when it came to things like the White House cookie policy, was actually worse on issues about uh, privacy and surveillance than the Bush administration. So, um, you know, one of the things I didn't want to do was write a Bush bashing book because I thought that there was an inherent conflict that government agencies face when it comes to creating digital media, which is it's hard to be both a content creator and a regulator. And I think that's an inherent conflict and that no matter what administration you're talking about, it's very difficult to figure out how you're going to manage creating digital files that can reach unintended audiences and be used for unanticipated purposes and do the work of governance. Um, I also was very skeptical of this idea, I don't know how many of you ever heard of this idea of the military entertainment complex, which is this idea that there's sort of this hegemonic push toward a particular kind of militarism that's driven by a combination of technology and authoritarian power. And you know, when I actually interview the people who create military video games, I find out that things are actually a lot more complicated. And in fact, a lot of those people understand their work creating games for the military as actually working against certain kinds of military goals. Um, and so this, you know, the complicated constellation of goals and values that, that comes into play when you're talking about a lot of different people um, in government organizations, it's, it's really important to keep in mind. And frankly, um, when you trawl around on government websites, you, f you find all sorts of subversive material. So it seems like there isn't this all-powerful hegemonic government uh, because you find things like Al Jazeera transcripts or Bertolt Brecht poems on government websites, even during the Bush administration. And I think that's something that's important to keep in mind. So I'm just going to tell two stories from this book and then tell you a little bit about the other book. So the first story has to do with the House Select Intelligence Committee. And of course, being an intelligence committee uh, during the Bush administration, um, they didn't have a lot of open hearings because in general, the intelligence committee discusses matters of national intelligence and the hearings are closed. Now, this was a hearing on, called, on terrorist use of the internet. And the media was actually invited to attend this particular hearing. So these uh, experts from the Pentagon gave a long presentation, PowerPoint presentation. I'm fascinated with the rhetoric of PowerPoint. It's a really, you know, I think that, that you know, Tufty and all these people get really upset about PowerPoint, but it can also, as I argue in the book, be, be used in certain subversive ways because it's also these large, rich media files that can be changed and appropriated by, and that people know how to use it, including, you know, like service members who have a beef with their 
um, commanding officers. Um, so anyway, the House Intelligence Committee met. Um, there, these experts had been paid several million dollars to put together this presentation. And the final thing that they showed was this example of what was supposed to be a terrorist video game. And this was supposed to be a video game that had been created by uh, Islamic militants to try to uh, seduce young people to the side of jihad. And, you know, this got a lot of media coverage because it combined two things that the media love to wring their hands about moralistically. One is terrorism and the other is video games. So it was like the perfect story for every news organization to run with. Um, except, any of you know what this is from? This terrorist video game? Good guess. It's Battlefield 2. So this is actually a fan film of Battlefield 2. And what's particularly embarrassing is the soundtrack for this. Part of this is, is from the movie Team America. And you can actually hear Trey Parker's voice. You know the section where he, he pretends to go undercover as a jihadist in order to like expose the terrorist subplot, right? That's that section of the movie. That is the, the soundtrack for this. And of course, what no one on the committee realized, or none of their aides, or none of the experts, or none of the me members of the media realized, is that in video games, you can play as a member of the opposing side. So if you play a World War II game, Right? You, can, you can spend 30 hours fighting the Nazis, and then you come back through and you play again as a Nazi. Right? And that's a structural feature of the game. But they didn't realize this. So the fact that you could actually play as a member of this Islamic United Front was something that they thought only terrorists could have come up with. Right? This could not have been created by Electronic Arts, which was the company that created it. So, you know, I'm interested, and in what I particularly love is the experts who were paid $7 million. They're actually right here in La Jolla, SAIC. Um, so I tried to interview them for this book. I tried really hard because I was interesting, just interested in just finding out how everything went wrong. But they didn't want to talk to me for some reason. So unfortunately, I, I don't have their side of the story. So um, how was it that the government so profoundly misunderstood a common behavior among fans. So why was it the, these digital remix practices were so alien that they were perceived of as potentially criminal? And I think that's a complicated question. And I think I'm going to tell another story. And instead of being a story about fans, it's a story about hackers. So Christopher Segoyan was a graduate student at the University of Indiana. Anybody know Segoyan's work? He writes for a blog called Surveillance State. Yeah, some people know his work. So Segoyan came home one day, and he found out that his front door had been kicked in, and that the, uh, his windows had been smashed, and uh, all of his computers had been stolen, and his passports had been stolen, and he called the police. And the police said, you're on your own. And it was then that he found the search warrant. Um, and the reason that he had a search warrant duct taped to his kitchen uh, was because he had created this, the Northwest Boarding Pass Generator, which he had created to protest the fact that um, the TSA, TSA um, boarding pass system was a kind of security theater that when they check the boarding pass, they're not able to actually read that barcode. So there's no time that you ever actually um, present both your identification and uh, the electronically readable ticket at the same time. So there's, there's no, it doesn't actually do anything to prevent somebody from the watch list from getting on a plane. Because, um, and so he created this boarding pass generator to, to dramatize the fact that you didn't even need Photoshop to create fake boarding passes. And so people went to his site, and they printed out tons and tons of boarding passes and had a jolly time. And you can see that uh, Christopher Sogoyan himself created this one for Osama bin Laden. Now, the government was not amused by that at all. Although, certainly, the community of hacker friends that he had was pretty amused by that. In fact, 
Some of them created boarding pass generators of their own, and they created different ways so that they could be uh, not they could they could not be tied to a particular server and could be something that you could pick up and and move to other kinds of sites. Um, and they also created their own warrant generator, which I find rather <laughs> amusing. And this, of course, just freaked the federal authorities out. Right, all of this you know, subversive, satiric behavior by hackers, right? They just did not understand that. And his, um, his advisor was grilled. I mean, he was put under all sorts of, of, of threats and forms of surveillance and all sorts of unpleasant things. Um, and so one of the things I write about is kind of how do we understand this particular genre of the, of the web generator? And this is a um, when Sam Zell was head of the Los Angeles Times, uh, the writers of the Los Angeles Times created this uh, this uh, generic uh, resignation letter generator that, that employees could give to Sam Zell. And many of you might be familiar with the church sign generator. And there's actually a, a rich community of people who make these humorous generators and often share the code about it. But this practice just was something that the Bush administration just found completely alien and criminal and something to be discouraged. Um, and so I was interested in the question of like what makes things like video game play or um, the use of social network site or the sharing of code or peer-to-peer -peer file sharing, like why all these new kinds of digital practices were immediately assumed to be criminal. And part of that is, and is I, I talked about inheritances from the Clinton administration, but it's also important to note that when you think when you look back at the transcript of these different committees who are reacting to people like Christopher Segoyan or to Samir, who was the creator of that fan film, people from both sides of the political aisle were very eager to participate. So Democratic elected officials were just as eager to rein in digital rights as their Republican counterparts, sometimes more so. Um, and what's interesting to me as a rhetorician is this proliferation of genres and how people learn to recognize the conventions of these new genres. And that sometimes people are struggling even in genres that seem like they have very clearly defined parameters, like email or PowerPoint presentations. Does anybody recognize the PowerPoint presentation in the lower right-hand corner, other than Scott? It's the presentation that was given by Colin Powell. Um, to make the weapons of mass destruction argument. And I believe in the upper uh, left-hand corner is one of the emails uh, related to the, the uh, Columbia accident, not the Challenger accident. Um, one of the interesting things about that accident is that people on board the shuttle were able to <coughs> send and receive email, um, and that engineers who were aware of the design flaw were actually emailing each other. And if there was an evil panopticon in which all federal employees were being surveilled. They would have noticed the fact that these engineers were talking to each other about this design flaw that they were worried about. But of course, there isn't an evil surveilling uh, apparatus that is able to watch all federal employees at the same time. So these emails ended up becoming an issue after the fact. Um, often the Bush administration had a tough time with satire, had a tough time with appropriation, and sometimes tried to use intellectual property law as a shield. And Interestingly, there have been cases where the Obama administration has put intellectual property um, markers on government documents that should be in the public domain and should not be marked with the copyright symbol and should not be claimed as, um, as, as something that can't be altered. Um, but I think when you, you look around at the practices of the Bush administration, there were actually people who were doing very interesting work in very new digital spaces. So this is actually uh, an employee of the CDC, um, and, uh, and he is uh, in a, his female avatar um, playing the role of a CDC official. Um, and so the fact that uh, an employee of the federal government was sort of encouraged to do this kind of cross-gender online play and was actually rewarded for innovation is something that often gets forgotten, I think, about that administration. Now, of course, the administration also did some really stupid stuff, too. Um, but I wouldn't say that they did stupid stuff because they were stupid. I think that's, that's jumping to a conclusion that's actually not supportable. 
I mean, I think that sometimes people don't think out the rhetorical consequences all the way. So how many people are familiar with the sippy cup story involving the TSA? So the TSA uh, had the, the distinction of being one of the most hated federal agencies. And um, there's this famous case in which a woman uh, had a sippy cup that had liquid in it. And she got in an altercation with the people at the TSA about the sippy cup for her toddler. And she felt like she was humiliated by the TSA officers. Now, the TSA on their website created this, this Mythbusters site where they wanted to supposedly clear up the question of whether or not TSA officers had acted appropriately. But the problem is they somehow looked at the visual evidence and didn't really understand how other people would read it. So as somebody who's watched these videos, it doesn't look good for the TSA. You know, it just doesn't look good. And it's, it's interesting that they decided to put it up on their website as though it would prove the point. It would provide the evidence that would make their case. And they didn't need to do any other rhetorical work, that the video would just prove the case, and that would be it. Um, and I would tend to say that you need to do a lot more discursive work in order to have um, digital rhetoric make sense to it anybody. And you have to have a lot more engagement. Um, and sometimes, so I'm fascinated with children's websites. And I'm fascinated with how terrible they are in general. Like the fact that you know, most children who go to government websites go there because they're writing school research reports. And they would like some actual information. They really don't want to do puzzles and games and cartoon characters. And yet that's what is there for them. Um, and I'm from Southern California. So this is actually from the Department of Homeland Security. This is the, the, the uh, website mascots that they created for their children's version of the ready.gov site. OK, I'm from Southern California. When I think safety, I don't think mountain lion. <laughs> you know, but people in Washington, DC, it's a mountain lion. It'll be fun. People from California, you know, we don't think Mountain lion, fun, safety, no. And sometimes just working things all the way through to thinking about <coughs> the logical consequences of making particular design choices. So for example, here's fatherhood.gov, which was created under the Bush administration, and I must point out, is still active under the Obama administration. And what is the most obvious first question that you might have when you come to fatherhood.gov? You guys aren't thinking of it? Is there motherhood.gov? And guess what? There's not a motherhood.gov. You get a 404 message when you go there. So, uh, no. so what does that say? It says that fathers are deadbeats and mothers typically aren't. Does it? All right. <laughs> So fathers need government help with their <laughs> parental duties, while mothers somehow don't. Or fatherhood is something that the government feels investment in pro invested in propping up, while motherhood, ah, eh, you know, they'll do the work regardless. Um, you know, there's, uh, you know, Scott does a lot of research on how people design the interfaces that. That, that serve as the public face of different institutions. And it just seems like not enough questions were asked about designing this site. Now, I used to spend a lot of time making fun of bad uh, uh, digital rhetoric from the federal government. In fact, I, every year I used to give out the Foley's, which were the prizes for the worst examples of digital design by the federal, state, and local government. Um, but you know what? that doesn't necessarily bring the conversation forward very much. Because I think one of the things that's really tricky about democracy is that there's a tendency to want technology to bring us direct democracy. And we, but the problem is when we value direct democracy, we don't think about all the other values that might be involved in democracy. And one of the things I often make the argument for is that we need to think more about technology in relationship to representative democracy, not only in the idea of thinking about how our political representatives represent us, 
but also how do we think about questions of representation more broadly when it comes to our governing entities. So another interesting thing in looking back at my first book, which I actually think, you know, when you write books about technology, there are usually parts that are just spectacularly wrong, often before the thing has actually gone to press. Um, but I, I'm not seeing that many things that I, I would retract or change. But I do think that there's some things that I could have been a little clearer on. So that you sort of need a secret decoder ring to know that I'm approaching these issues from the standpoint of feminist theory. Um, and I think that it's useful sometimes to be clear about what your theoretical frameworks are when you're talking about digital design. You could sort of, like I say, if you have the secret decoder ring and you know what words like invisible labor or messy infrastructures mean in a kind of feminist theoretical context, you'd be able to figure it out. And you also might notice the fact that you know, I wrote about Photoshop in relationship to feminist bloggers, or I was interested in sort of depictions of femininity in relationship to people who used email for whistleblowing, which I thought was interesting. I, I was interested in the kind of complex picture of gender that emerged in public diplomacy campaigns online, and the ways that the government would try to moderate user behavior when it came to images that had particular kinds of gender, um, uh, gender ideologies associated with them. And I'm interested in the labor of digitization and who, and the kind of return of the repressed of manual labor. Um, and in this case, sometimes feminized labor. So I love the fact that this woman's hand accidentally appears in Google book search. They fix that now. And I actually had to go through a lot of hassles to get the rights to this image from, from Google, because they were like, well, what about the woman's rights in her hand? And it's like, oh, come on. It's not identifiable. You give me permission. Um, and I have written about the role of women computers in the space program and the fact that Vannevar Bush, who's often celebrated for As We May Think, if you look very closely, particularly at how he uses the word girl in As We May Think, you notice that he's really perceiving women in the workplace of the modern business computing environment or the modern military computing environment or the modern scientific computing environment as disruptive. Um, and he talks about their disquieting gaze and how they stroke the keys of their various digital devices. And so, you know, for Vannevar Bush, like a device like this is awesome because you get rid of the woman at work because she's a distraction. Um, and so the tendency to look at a device like this and say it's futuristic, it represents some, the, the, you know, the utopian technological future that we were moving toward even then, rather than thinking sometimes people have weird reactionary agendas and that those agendas have to do with getting rid of women in computing environments. Um, and I'd like to call out some those specific feminist thinkers that are really useful to read if you haven't read them before. So uh, I don't know if, if people are familiar with the work of Lee Starr, uh, Susan Lee Starr. Um, she, Paul Dorish talks about her work a lot. Um, Philip Egri, uh, in what I still think is a great essay on infrastructure in the university, um, talks about her work on infrastructure and its messiness and its complexities. Um, so read Lee Starr if you haven't read Lee Starr. And another person who I think is really useful to read is Lucy Sechman. I think her work on situated actions and, and interactive uh, uh, context is really useful for thinking about how humans and machines, um, uh, the, the, the ideal of planning doesn't actually map out completely when you look at how people actually interact with technologies. So with those kinds of theorists in mind, um, I have a new book. Um, and I can't hand it around yet until May. And then I can hand it around and say, look, this is my new book. But this is what it will look like. Um, it's called The War on Learning. Um, it's intended to be polemical. That's why I've given it a polemical kind of title. Um, I think that polemics can be valuable. What I don't think is valuable, though, is polemics that, that fall too hard on either the cyber utopian or the cyber dystopian side. Um, my message tends to be, hey, pay attention, it's complicated, rather than, hey, pay attention, everything is rosy and wonderful, or hey, pay attention, things are going to hell in a handbasket. Um, because I, I really think that more discussion, more conversation, more attention to these unexplored areas of ideology when it comes to technology, um, for people to take you seriously, um, taking these extreme positions doesn't actually help. So I open the book 
with my interest in cheating videos on YouTube. And this is a genre I am just fascinated with. Have any of you guys ever seen some of these videos? They're, they're just really interesting because there's so much um, artisanal uh, uh, expertise. So one of the things that, um, that students will do is they will create these fake labels for like a bottle of Coke and cover it with formulae and they'll typeset it so it looks just like a label of a bottle of Coke and then bring it into the, the exam. Or, you know, there's these other very elaborate techniques. And you could go to YouTube and other video sharing sites and you could find these, you know, great DIY how-to videos. Um, and I thought this was just fascinating. And I think it gets back to kind of one of the hard questions, which is sometimes students learn, but they don't learn the things we want them to learn. And that happens more and more when you get tech, digital technology involved. So I wrote about this uh, on my blog, and it got picked up by the Chronicle of Higher Education, and then it got picked up by a newspaper in Louisiana who interviewed me, and then it got picked up by the Chicago Sun-Times, and then Good Mer Morning America called. And they wanted like a super moralistic piece, but they also wanted like voyeurism as well. So it's like, oh, young people are so evil, but let's show them in their unrepentant state, you know, in their, in their exotic condition. Um, and it became clear from like talking to the producers that I was not the moralistic college professor, school marm that they wanted um, to be talking about how awful high-tech che high cheating really was. Um, so they finally kind of gave up on the project of, uh, of getting my commentary. Um, but I do think that this, the, this kind of subversive student behavior that, that indicates uh, uh, collective knowledge sharing uh, is important to pay attention to. Uh, I'm personally fascinated with different kinds of remixes. So this is a professor who came to work one day under the uh, influence of a particular pharmacological substance that has not yet um, been completely identified. Um, but he showed up at work considerably disinhibited, um, and he used four-letter words, he rolled around on the ground, he, did, he asked students about their vacation plans, he exposed his midsection, he did all sorts of wacky things. And then, of course, there were students who were watching it live in the audience, but also students who were watching it uh, from a distance learning perspective. So what do you think happened to that video pretty much five minutes after the first person watched it. it. It went viral, right? It became a meme. And of course, there were stone professor remixes and baked professor remixes and parodies and all this stuff. And the University of Florida is going crazy, trying to claim intellectual property and get it all back and put everything back in the box. And you know, they, they failed miserably at that. But what's interesting to me is actually watching the second hour when he's, he's disinhibited, but a little bit more coherent. And he gives a talk about scientific management, and he talks about the university. And it's a very frank talk by someone who's clearly a, an adjunct, who feels marginalized, who, who wonders about the role of technology in learning. Um, and no one watches the second half, because it's not funny. It's, thought-provoking. It's interesting. But I watch the second half when I talk about it. I'm, I'm also interested in angry professor remixes and the fact that students cre uh, like will capture bad behavior by their professors and then put it online. Um, and I'm interested in how often those angry professor moments have to do with technology, have to do with a cell phone going off, have to do with inappropriate laptop surfing, and how often it becomes much more about this two-way dance between exposing the professor and the student's inappropriate conduct around technology, and then how that in turn is mediated itself. Um, I think these things are complicated, though. Um, in the case of, I'm from Six College, um, and I'm delighted that Bill Griswold is here. Um, because Bill has been part of a series of really innovative experiments trying to give uh, undergraduates 
uh, access to ubiquitous computing technologies that make the university less mysterious to them and make them feel more like, um, like participants rather than spectators. Um, so uh, in the book, I write about the HP Jornada uh, distribution. Um, I do call it a gadget distribution, and, and I don't mean that for that to be pejorative. I just want to look at the whole sequence of distributions to first-year college students of ubiquitous computing devices um, in different contexts. Because now we've had about a decade of this, giving every college freshman an iPad or giving every college freshman an iPod. Um, I actually think that the work, um, and I recommend these articles that Bill wrote both with Matt Ratto, uh, who's known for his work on critical making and some of this, these other works, where he talks about the kind of conflicts of introducing this technology and the kind of unintended consequences, but also a, a willingness to work with artists um, and a, a willingness to sort of see patterns of appropriation that weren't necessarily planned, that weren't necessarily scripted out. Um, so I actually think this, this work stands up pretty well, even though most of these devices sort of ended up, uh, you know, in e-waste or, you know, on eBay or, you know, the students aren't still using those devices now. Um, but I think that, that these kinds of historical moments are interesting, and it's important to know that there's a history of in instructional technology. There's a tendency to treat every kind of instructional technology as something that is radically new, rather than realize that we're talking about, you know, going back to magic lantern shows over 200 years of instructional technologies of various kinds. Um, and I also think it's really important to think about instructional technology very broadly. Right, chairs can be an instructional technology. Windows can be an instructional technology. Um, there are ways in which the physical environment of the classroom is technological, and there's a tendency to only think about digital technologies as being technology. So I'm interested in how people imagine these gadgets allow students to read the university in different ways, and what they think the university is in relationship to these gadgets. And so that's one of the things I explore in this chapter. Um, people are now starting to call this my MOOC book. Um, there are only two chapters in the book that are about uh, massive open online courses. Um, and Scott very kindly read uh, those chapters in which he is actually featured. Um, I should say something about my practice. When I write about uh, someone, it, I often travel and interview them, but I also then will give them copy of what I've written about afterwards. Not everyone does this. I actually think it's a really good practice. Um, so all of the people that I interview in the first book, and I, I try to always give people the copy of the work so that they can look at it and see whether or not I've been a fair dealer when it comes to talking about these technology practices. Um, so one of the things that was interesting about taking, so I was actually a student in Scott's course. Um, I traveled up to uh, Northern California for a meetup in a park. I, I went up with a 23-year-old uh, computer programmer from Belarus who wanted to get into graduate school. Um, she did actually get into CMU. She was successful in this. She emailed me her personal statements several times, and I made a lot of suggestions about it. Um, she also was interested in meeting other people in Russian topic. And I didn't put this in the book, but I think she was interested in romantically meeting them which uh, uh, was an interesting part of uh, our interaction. And I think part of what you know, sometimes people look for online isn't just education, but other kinds of social interaction. And she was part of this group of Russian speakers who had their own sort of separate subculture inside the culture of people who were taking the course. But what was particularly memorable about taking this course is in the middle of the course, it turned into a critique of the user interface of the course itself which was kind of fascinating. So there were these sort of meta moments where you were watching um, Scott Clemmer in the window in which he was explaining the problems with the window, right? So you were actually like watching him explain why the navigation was bad, and then you could see the navigation all around it. So it was like kind of this fascinating infinite regress that was kind of crazy. Um, so I think that MOOCs, you know, as Scott said, I, I try to be fair about things. I've been a student in a number of MOOCs and have learned things from those courses. And I think that um, they're valuable as ways to think about the textbook in new ways. 
I think they're very valuable for people to think critically about their own teaching. And I think they're incredibly valuable to acknowledge the fact that people learn online, whether you like it or not. And that you might as well accept that people are learning this way. Um, but as part of the MIT Media Lab, MacArthur Foundation, and UCHRI, Humanities Research Institute, Reclaim Open Learning Working Group, um, we wanted to, we thought that there was a lot of attention being paid to MOOCs and not a lot of attention about other kinds of interesting experiments. And that MOOCs were often too much like conventional lecture education driven by multiple choice testing and kind of more conventional forms of peer learning rather than really doing experimental things. So we acknowledged five winners from around the world. We had two winners from the United States, uh, two from Great Britain, and one from India. Um, they included um, Jonathan Wirth, who is at Coventry University, who teaches a photography class uh, with up to 30,000 students. And what's interesting about the class is um, it's actually not inside this sort of giant Coursera type um, course management system. It's out in the wild. And, and students use different kinds of social media platforms in order to share their photographic works. And they're using a bunch of different kinds of technologies to facilitate social interaction. But this is a hugely popular course. And a lot of professional photographers participated in the course. And there was just a, a whole range of kinds of interesting participation. Another interesting model that we wanted to acknowledge in the Reclaim Open Learning Symposium was this is uh, two uh, staff members from JAGA. JAGA is an art space, co-working space, um, community space in Bangalore um, that um, is developing ways for people to take online courses in a in the context of face-to-face -face interaction so that people can work on projects together in a live embodied way in addition to the online work. Um, and you know, it was interesting to talk to these two people about they're both Coursera dropouts, multiple dropouts, and they talked about just how frustrating it was to do the peer work, how they often felt let down by their peers, how hard it was to get meaningful feedback um, through the kind of impersonal interface. And I think these kinds of experiments that try to, try to take advantage of material that's available online but repurpose it for a live interaction, I think these are really promising. And then uh, my own group, I recused myself, uh, FemTechNet, the Dialogues on Feminism and Technology project, which tries to have leading scholars of technology uh, in dialogue with each other, so less monologic, and also create a system so that students can create videos back to the professors. So it's not just a one-to-many communication channel, but instead a many-to-many -many communication channel. And I'm proud of the fact that we've already gotten in trouble with Fox News. They ran a story, I believe it was called, um, Students Get Course Credit from Feminists for Corrupting Wikipedia, I believe was the full title of the story. Because uh, one of the assignments is a wiki storming assignment. So um, with that, I'm just happy to answer questions. Uh, I'm also active in the Digital Humanities SoCal group, uh, working with, uh, I believe in this idea of regional advantage that Annalise Saxinian talks about. And I think one of the great things about being in Southern California, um, as people interested in design, is there's a lot happening in design in Southern California. So I would encourage you guys to preferably carpool, but visit other campuses in the area doing interesting things. So I'm happy to talk about my research, and I'm happy to talk about my, my next book, which is about Barack Obama and his use of ubiquitous computing technologies, public diplomacy platforms, and his uncomfortable relationship with questions around surveillance and privacy. Thank you. So questions, comments, complaints? Yes. So you showed us a lot of examples uh, about how people had not really taken care about or thinking about all the different issues when they were designing and putting things on the table. For example, the father would have to go to school. Apart from that, what, what uh, are the other crisp design topics uh, or suggestions that you have? 
Yeah, I mean, this is all terrifying to me because I, I, in addition to knowing nothing about ethnography, I know absolutely nothing about design. Although I'm actually married to a designer. He, he, he's actually designed one of the Google Doodles on the, the homepage of, of Google. But I, um, I, I teach from a design literature relatively frequently. Uh, I'm, 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 I have a couple of pieces in the ACM computer science library, uh, but I feel reluctant to, uh, to speak to people as designers. What I can do, though, is speak to you as rhetoricians, which is there's a tendency to not think about this question of who we speak for and how we think about ourselves as creating discourses within particular rhetorical occasions and thinking about purposes and audiences that might not be the purposes and audiences that we intend. And so I think the main piece of advice that I would have for designers is don't be upset when purposes and audiences that you didn't initially plan for emerge. That you can do a certain amount of advanced planning, mostly by talking to as many people as possible and doing what I do, like going to see people face to face. You, you avoid making a lot of mistakes when you don't just Skype with people, when you actually go to see the circumstances under, under which a technology is used. You know, I just got back from a very interesting three-week trip uh, in India where I was uh, talking to uh, women's rights advocates who had been working with social media before the Delhi rape case and talking about kind of how they moderated the electronic conversation, you know, when there was this huge rush of public attention around these issues. Um, and, you know, lots of trolls, you know, arguing for men's rights and all of this stuff. Um, so. Um, I think there's something, val and I could have like just interviewed them via Skype, right? I didn't need to get on a plane and go there, but actually I did need to get on a plane and go there. So I think that the more that you're willing to talk to a variety of people and that you're willing to kind of see how people actually, I mean, it, there's a lot of great work being done on, on techno-missionary assumptions. Um, um, Rayvon Fouché has written great stuff about one laptop per child. Um, I think it's really important, um, if you haven't read uh, some of the work of Francois Barr's group, looking at social computing around the world and the assumption that people want personal computing uh, and how that's flawed when you look at how people actually live and work with technology. Um, so I would say, you know, my, my main piece of advice would be talk to tons of people, cross disciplinary boundaries, and, you know, travel the world. And, you know, you, you'll write better scholarship, but you'll also have kind of an interesting time of it as well. Does that answer your question, I hope? Yeah. So one, I mean, one thing that's been interesting about uh, design is that over the past couple decades, designers keep changing what goes on their business card and uh, to fu fuzzier and fuzzier titles. <laughs> and I think, you know, it's gone from... Uh, a programmer or a graphic designer to interaction designer to experience designer and I think part of it is that what we're what we're seeking in design is not just where do we put the pixels but uh, looking at the um, where where we see potential for emergent phenomena to happen and one thing that I thought was really interesting in your analysis of online classes was that difference between have we accidentally or intentionally um, collapsed the number of points of view on a particular topic and and how does that change things and your photography example is really interesting because um, it's so natural it it's such a natural medium for 30,000 people to share stuff mm -hmm. because it, it just works it's a the, the community creation and the topic fit together really well. Have you seen other, are there, are there pl other, other, other potentials that you see or other things besides photography where, you know, you can hold that up as, as examples of a, of a more multifarious creation? Um, yeah, I mean, with this Reclaim Open Learning Challenge, we got to see a lot of interesting examples. Um, that there's interesting work being done sometimes by people who work in um, museum design in this area who are already thinking about public outreach in new ways. Um, so a lot of the examples that we saw, even though they might not have made it into the, the final count, um, were actually from people in the museum design community, which I always find interesting because my partner, before he 
Um, he was actually in the themed entertainment industry for a long time. And, uh, you know, I would go to these themed entertainment industry, like, uh, trade shows and, you know, like seeing all the different kinds of, you know, ball pits and all the different kinds of roller coasters and all this other stuff. But a lot of the people who, you know, there was this funny split where, you know, the people who worked in the themed entertainment industry, when they decided that there were enough theme parks in the world and that we did, really didn't need to build any more in the developing world, that some of those people went into interaction design and game design. And then some of those people went into museum design. And so there's kind of an interesting uh, sort of second life of the, the careers of that particular community practice. It would be kind of interesting to, to follow through. Um, I'm trying to think of other kinds of interesting themes that evolved. I would say that um, the problem with sometimes the maker movement, we were hoping that we would see more interesting examples from that community, is that it, it really is very material specific and site specific and that um, that sometimes people were just creating iterations of the same how-to video rather than really having a, a conversation with each other. So I think we were actually disappointed not to get more interesting stuff from different kinds of maker spaces. Because we kind of thought, there are all these interesting pedagogical practices. Maybe there's some way there could be a higher ed connection. Not really as much. Um, I think Trevor Schultz has done some interesting stuff looking back to the 70s and to work that was done in Germany, often by artists who wanted to rethink the university system um, and create these kind of crazy artists, free public open university experiments before technology where they were just trying to include regular people in these made up utopian universities. Um, and so he organized a conference called Mobility Shifts um, about two or three years ago. Six College was actually a co-sponsor of that conference. Um, and all the videos are up online. And that had people like Henry Jenkins and Mimi Ito and you know a lot of interesting people talking about different kinds of, of experiments that were being done. But I think you're right that the conversation has narrowed in a way. And we're trying to kind of open it back up again. I think Nishant Shah also says some interesting things where he says, what does it mean to have the technology solve a problem? Like, what does it mean to, to like, he's always asking kind of what and why? And are we jumping to the assumption that technology is the reform that we, we need? I mean, one of the things I write in the end of the book, I have this whole section where I'm writing to university presidents and trying to imagine what I would tell them. And I, I say, first of all, that technologies like email are undervalued in terms of facilitating student-faculty interaction. Um, Although, you know, most students don't actually use email, so you have to kind of move on to other platforms. And then also that there's something to be said for using the technologies that faculty themselves use and trying to bring undergraduates into contact with those technologies rather than import a bunch of iPads. So, you know, there's, you've got some amazing spectronometer, blah, 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 you know, in your lab. Wouldn't it be cool to give undergraduates some time? Now, I know it's multi-million dollar equipment and you don't want undergraduates to break things, but those are the meaningful interactions with technologies. That's a lot more meaningful than just, you know, a device that's really best for reading and watching movies. But there's a tension there then because you've got um, one thing that we scold people for is the belief that uh, other people want the same technology that we want. But at the same time, we scold other people for assuming, oh, other people don't want the thing that I love. We'll design one laptop per child, which is totally different than the thing that we have, because other people are different. And so we'll give them the dumbed down version. Yeah, I mean, one laptop per child is interesting to me because it go kind of goes back to my fascination with children's websites. It's like an imagining a computer to be as toy-like as possible. And when I talked to the one laptop per child designers at MIT, a lot of them talked about how important that was that it be the child's own computer, that it, it not be something that an adult can appropriate. Um, and I'm going to tell one more story from the youth center. Is that okay? Okay. So when I worked at this youth center, I, you know, I was constantly horrified at the behavior of the clients, horrified. But one of the things that I found terrible was we had this mass bicycle giveaway at Christmas time. And 
you know, I was, have you ever tried to wrap a bicycle? Okay, it's not easy to do. And we would give away like 10 bicycles, 20 bicycles at Christmas time. We'd have this big Christmas party and we would give away bicycles. And then, you know, I'd see the kids at the center and it was really painful because what had usually happened is the bicycle had been sold pretty much immediately after we gave the kids the bicycle. And from my perspective, right, I was outraged. I thought these terrible parents who are taking this thing that belongs to their child, this technology that is for their child, and they have sold it. And what I didn't understand is that a technology the, the whole family can't use is not particularly useful. That turning that into bus fare so that mom can get to work is a lot more important than that beautiful pink bicycle that only the five-year-old can ride. And I mean, that's, I think, an important lesson for all of us to learn. And I think that's, that was my thought when I looked at the first time at SIGGRAPH. I was at SIGGRAPH, actually. And I said, oh my god, they're giving away little pink bicycles is what they're doing.